Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful morning where we can come into your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the GFA team, the Northeast team, all of the, the leaders, the workers. We thank you for raising this ministry in this great nation and elsewhere in Asia and the world. Lord, even right now as we turn to your word for counsel and encouragement, Lord, as we, the workers in your vineyard, we always need encouragement because the devil is always attacking us. And his number one weapon against us, we workers in your vineyard, is discouragement. And even as we turn to your word for encouragement this morning, we pray that, Lord, you will speak to us. Your Holy Spirit will open up scriptures that we have seen so many times before and bring in new truths that we will see and appreciate and understand and grasp for our lives so that our lives will change. We thank you for this time. In Jesus Christ and I pray. Amen. We all know that India won the 2020 World Cup. Now, one of the greatest things about that win was India won the 2020 World Cup without its big names, without the big guys in the Indian cricket team. They almost call that these three guys as the trinity of Indian cricket. The present trinity, you know. I'm talking about Rahul Dravid. I'm talking about Sachin Tendulkar. I'm talking about Saurabh Ganguly. These three guys, together they might have even 30,000 or 40,000 runs, international runs. And these three guys were not playing in the 2020 World Cup. And also India was without its great, perhaps the best bowler in the Indian team right now. Zahir Khan, the strike bowler. India's strike bowler after uh, Srinath retired, you know. Uh, this guy was also not there. Anil Kumble is, well, is not even in the one-day team, and he's not even in the, he was not even in the 2020 team. These five, perhaps these five great guys were not there. Even then, India, with unknown guys like Joginder Sharma, who all, who became the last over specialist, no last over specialist. No unknown guys. Nobody has heard about Joginder Sharma. Nobody people have heard about Uttapam, but not they have not heard about Uttappa. You know, we South Indians like Uttapam, but we have not heard about Uttappa, but he was one of the stars. You know, uh, it is amazing. If Uttappa had, had not run out Imran Nazir in the final, Imran Nazir was playing like Vivian Richards in the World Cup 1983. Some of us were watched the 1983 World Cup. I have not watched it. My uncle has watched it and he's told me about that. Now, the way Vivian Richards was batting in that World Cup 83 final, the match was going to be over the same way Imran Nazir was batting in this World Cup final, the 2020 World Cup final. Vivian Richards got out of 33, giving a catch, brilliant catch by Kapil Dev, and India were back in that match. Imran Nazir was batting on 33, Robin Uthappa made a brilliant run out. This devout Catholic made a brilliant run out, and India were back in the match. Now, unknown names, these guys were not famous, but they won the match for India. Now, having began with that, I want you to read one verse from the Bible. I want to I I take you through some of the verses. I usually don't read so many scriptures that I try to quote them because uh, these days young people don't have the patience to turn scriptures and, you know, and, uh, and read and then follow a message. So I have print words, verses printed out. I quote them and I preach to them. I move up and down, but this is a different group. So I'm going to read a lot of verses and I believe God is going to speak to us. Now, we, the Bible teaches we have a great God. I'm talking about the greats of Indian cricket. We have a great God. Let, look at Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 17. Uh, for your convenience, I will read out the scripture, but I would like you to follow it along, follow along in your Bible. I read from the English Standard Version, which is the latest in the, in the, in the tradition of literal translation of the Bible. English Standard Version, ESV, available at esv.org. ESV.org and uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 17 says uh, for the Lord your God is a God of gods the Lord of lords the great the mighty the awesome God who is not partial who takes no bribe we have a great God awesome God great God but that also means now uh, one of the observations as I have I've been in the last uh, uh, last 15 or 20 years I have been in the ministry in some way or the other I see is though we have a great God all of us need not become great all of us may not become great now uh, the other day I was traveling uh, in the train I think I was just leaving Ongol station 
I looked up and behind the station there was a huge balloon and on the top of the balloon in the, in the, in the balloon was a, uh, written the name of a great evangelist then I thought to myself my name will never be written in a balloon and it will never fly over a railway station like that but God spoke to me God, this is what God spoke to me and this is my message to you this morning you, you may never become famous but you can always be faithful you, never can, you can never become great but you can always be faithful to me and that is what I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to emphasize this morning in fact the Bible forgive, forbids you know, the Bible you know, tells us that we should not have the desire to become great there was this guy who was the assistant of prophet Jeremiah what was his name? his name was Baruch Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 45 and verse 5. What was Je- Baruch's job? Baruch was had to just write down what whatever Prophet Jeremiah spoke. He was he if Prophet Jeremiah prophesied something. Baruch had to take down notes and he had to put that in the form of a book or a, a form of a prophecy. But you know what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 45 and verse 5. And do you see great things for yourself? Seek them not, for behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. Do you think, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. Now we should not have a desire to have our name great. Oh, and that's, that's the lesson we learned from the life of Baruch. And, uh, you know, as I said, though all of us may never become great, we all can become faithful. We all can become faithful. And that is God's counsel for us. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 25, verses 21 and 23. Matthew 25, 21 and 23. Uh, his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And look at verse 23. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. God's expectation is that we will be faithful. All the other things are irrelevant at this point. Now, to understand this, very, this is a very obvious truth. You don't have to go to a Bible college to learn this. No, we, we, this is a very obvious truth. This is Sunday school truth. To understand this, uh, to truth, I studied the Bible and I, I found out there were some excellent illustrations for that and I'm going to share six of those illustrations for this very obvious truth that God wants us, it's more important that we be faithful than be famous now I'm going to share, talk about pairs of people and one guy was very famous the other guy was not so famous and the last guy I talk about, we don't even read his name in the Bible but, he was, but all of these lesser known guys were faithful. They faithfully did what God called them to do. And God was pleased with them. The first pair I talk about, and we find them in the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 22 and verse 11. Second Chronicles, chapter 22 and verse 11. The first pair that illustrates this, this truth that we need not be famous, but we must be faithful. Turn with me to the book of Second Chronicles, chapter 22 and verse 11 here we read about a woman named Jehoshiba in some bibles it's called uh, in a, here, here, uh, Jehoshabeth she's also called Jehoshiba a, a woman what did she do Jehoshiba what did you do if you talk to Jehoshiba now we understand all what she did look at verse 11 you understand what she did was she hid the little baby Joash she did the little baby Joash who was Joash Joash was the last living survivor of the family of David. God promised David that one, one person from his family will always sit on the throne of Israel, on the throne of Judah especially, forever and forever. And Joash was the last survivor of that family because Atalia, and then uh, it all started with Jezebel as well. Now, uh, Atalia especially, now the daughter of Jezebel and, uh, and Ahab, went out on a witch hunt as they say you know to killing up every descendant of David and only one baby survived only one baby survived and uh, who rescued her? this unknown woman called Jehoshiba and uh, what was her job? her job was to 
sub, take this little baby and give it to a nurse who put him inside a room. Simple job. We probably have never heard a sermon about Jehoshiba. But I'm sure you've heard of Joash who became the youngest ever king to rule the southern kingdom. In, in, second, in second Chronicles chapter 24 and verse 1, Second Chronicles 24 verse 1, he was 7 years old when he began to reign. He was the youngest king to rule the southern kingdom. And he was one of the rare kings who was good. We heard about the most famous Joash, but Joash would have never been alive but for the ministry of Jehoshiba. But for the ministry of Jehoshiba. A small, a simple job, you know, a simple job. God, you know, in, on the day of judgment, God is going to reward, you know, a job as uh, being a king of a big country, the same way he's going to reward a job of taking care of a little baby. Both are equal before God. Both jobs merit the same kind of reward from the great God. That's the first example I want to share with you. The second example I want to share with you, come with me to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 7. Nehemiah chapter 7 and uh, I'm going to show you another pair here one is famous the other is not so famous but faithful the book of Nehemiah chapter 7 and I want you to look at 2 and 3 in the Bible look at 2 and 3 and uh, here we talk about another guy what was his name? his name was Hananiah who was Hananiah? Hananiah was the brother of Nehemiah. Nehemiah, everybody knew about this guy. Nehemiah had a great government job. He was working with the Persian government. God spoke to him. He applied long leave. He traveled to Israel. He saw the broken walls of Jerusalem. And he was a charismatic leader. It was as if he was, you know, like, he, I, I would compare, you know, uh, Nehemiah to one of the uh, good, great captains that we have in world cricket today. Mahela Jaywadana. Mahela Jaywadana in the World Cup. In the West Indians World Cup, he, he was a great captain. He carried Sri Lanka team to the World Cup final. The same way, here was a very effective leader who carried his team along. In 52 days flat, he organized the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. They were a demoralized team. They, they were living outside the promised land for over 70 years. They were hopeless. But this guy was a charismatic leader and he organized. And there were people they were making fun of him. They said, even a fox climbs on the wall you have built, that wall will collapse. And they called him for a discussion. You know, there were a team of people, three guys who called him for a discussion. They said, we want to have a discussion with you on the plains of Ono. And you know, you know what he said to that call to have a discussion with him on the plains of Ono? He said, oh no, I'm not coming to Ono. Ono was a plain in which they had to have a discussion. They were calling him. They, he knew, Nehemiah knew they were only wasting his time. He said, oh no, I'm not coming to Ono. I am doing a great work! I cannot come down! That's what he says in Nehemiah 6. He's a very famous guy. You know, a guy preaches who would love to preach message upon message. But he had a younger brother. Nobody had heard about him. What was his job? His job was to ensure the gate on the wall of Jerusalem is always closed. That's it. That's it. Simple job. It's like almost a night watchman job, you know, a night watchman. Make sure the gate is closed before everybody goes to sleep. After everybody goes to sleep, after everybody comes inside the building, make sure the gate is closed. That was his job. But he was faithful. In fact, Nehemiah, Nehemiah and we read in Nehemiah chapter 7 verse 2, he was more faithful and God-fearing than many. He was very faithful in the simple job God gave him Closing the gate. The faithful. The faithful. Let me talk about another another couple. Turn with me to Second Kings chapter twenty-two. Second Kings chapter twenty-two, and I want to read verse fourteen. Second Kings chapter 40, twenty-two and verse fourteen. Let me begin by talking about the more famous person. The more, most famous person is one of the probably the only woman prophetess in the entire Bible. I mean, there may be others, but she's perhaps the most popular. She gave counseling ministry to a king, to the king who's perhaps the greatest king to rule the southern kingdom, apart from David. 
greatest king to rule the divided southern kingdom. Bible college students know what I'm talking about. The greatest king to rule the divided southern kingdom, King Josiah. What was her name? Halda. When uh, Josiah, the, the king I talk about, was confused about a certain passage of scripture, he sent people to Halda to get explanation. Here was a woman who was a prophetess. Here was a woman giving counsel to Josiah. Josiah is not only Josiah is not only the greatest king of the southern kingdom. I would go to the extent of saying he is the greatest fully human character in the Bible. Not because my brother is named after him. Prince Josiah Benjamin is my brother's full name. But you know, my, my study of God's word tells me that Josiah is the fully greatest fully human character found in the entire Bible. You know why? What is the greatest commandment that we have in the Bible? In Matthew chapter 22 and verse 31, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And Josiah followed the greatest commandment perfectly. Look at what the Bible says about him in 1 Kings chapter 21 and verse 25. Or 1 Kings, 1 Kings 21 and 25. Second Kings. Second Kings chapter twenty one. I'm sorry. Twenty three and twenty five. Okay. Second Kings chapter twenty three and twenty five. Before him there was no king like him who turned the turn to the Lord with all his heart. Here was a king who obeyed the greatest commandment in the Bible perfectly. And that's why I believe he's the greatest king, greatest fully human character in the Bible. And this woman I talked about gave counseling to him, explained the scriptures to him indirectly. But you know what was, you know what her husband did? Second Kings 22:14. Second Kings 22:14. What was her husband's name? We don't even know. We don't even know the name of Halda's husband. Halda's husband's name was. Shalom. And the Bible says in 2 Kings 22 14, so Hilkiah the priest and Ahikim, Akobar, and Shaphan and Ashia went to Halda the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikwa, the son of Harhas, the keeper of the wardrobe. What was his responsibility? Taking care of the wardrobe, the special clothes people wore for the service of the temple. That was his responsibility. After they wore the special robes, they would throw it there or throw it here. He would collect it all and put it in the cupboard. That was his responsibility. He was faithful at doing that. On the day of judgment, there is going to be a same reward for Halda as well as Shalom. Assuming both of them did the jobs faithfully. Simple job. Taking care of the wardrobe of people. Laundry work. Simple job. Simple job. Come with me to the New Testament. I'm going to show you another pair. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Colossians, the book of Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. We read about a man here. Let me talk about the most famous first, the more famous partner here. He's called Mr. Christian. He's authored half of the New Testament. You know, every, every, every Christian doctrine we teach, we have to go to him to understand it fully. He has illustrated every possible Christian doctrine. What is his name? Paul. But Paul had a team member. We have never heard of him. You know what the Bible says about him in Colossians chapter 4, verse 12? Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus greets you always, struggling on behalf of you in his prayers that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. Epaphras. What was he? Faithful in doing what? Prayer. Faithful in prayer. Not only prayer, struggling in prayer. Wrestling. I think some versions use, he is wrestling for you in prayer. Wrestling for you in prayer. What was his name? 
Epaphras. He was part of Paul's team, Colossians 1.7. He was part of Paul's ministry team, Colossians 1.7. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, a beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made us your love in the Spirit. Faithful minister. That's what we all want God to tell us on the Day of Judgment. Not that we are very famous. That's secondary. That's just a byproduct. And we, don't, we, not, we should not be even interested in that byproduct. But we all should hear it on the Day of Judgment that we are faithful. We are faithful. Epaphras was a faithful minister. Faithful in what? Faithful in prayer. You know, preaching is very glamorous. I am a preacher, I can tell you that. You know, when you preach, there are hundreds of people looking, hundreds of eyes looking at you. When you share a joke, the eyes widen, they giggle, they laugh. And you, know, you can see the tears in the altar when you give the altar call. It's an absolutely fabulous ministry. But I want to tell you, prayer is not very glamorous. To lock yourself in the room and kneel down and cry out to God, that's not a glamorous ministry. Hundreds of eyes are not looking at you when you pray. But God is watching. God is watching. Now Jesus, have you ever, uh, have you ever wondered why the disciples never came to Jesus and asked him, Jesus, please teach us. Step number one, step number two, step number three to raise the dead. No, they never asked him. Please, Jesus, tell us five steps to preach a sermon. No, they never asked. Teach. They never asked him any of these things. The only thing that the disciples went and asked Jesus to teach him was prayer. Why? Prayer was the most obvious thing. The most attractive thing in the life of Jesus. And it's not a very glamorous ministry, prayer. And I thought that was very good at it. He was not only a, a prayer warrior, he was a wrestler. He wrestled with God for the blessing and for the blessing, for wrestled with God so God would pour his blessings on the believers he ministered to. He had such a great burden. He had such a great burden for his believers. Praying, praying, praying. Now, the other day, I, was, I, I have the habit of reading one chapter a day from each of the six sections of the Bible. One chapter from the law books, one chapter from the, uh, from the history books of the Old Testament, one chapter from the poetic books of the Old Testament, one chapter from the prophetic books of the Old Testament, one chapter from the Gospels, uh, including Acts, and then one chapter from the Epistles. The other day I was reading Samuel, and then I'm just mentioning this, this is, I'm going off track in this lesson, but this is something relevant. I was reading about Samuel. Samuel was a, such a guy, you know, amazing guy. He continues to amaze me. The other day I, I saw he was, he was so upset, he was so concerned for Saul, he was so much in prayer for Saul, at one point God had to tell him, stop worrying about Saul. Who told him? God had to tell him. He was so much burdened for Saul. What about our burden for the, the people we minister to? How much do we pray? God, Samuel prayed so much for Saul, God told him, enough. I have chosen another man to be the king of Israel. Stop praying for Saul. So much burden. You read that passage. Read, read 1 Samuel. Read, go through that section and understand how many times this guy is so upset that Saul is going in the wrong direction. Saul is going in the wrong direction. Epaphras was a silent prayer warrior on the ministry team of Paul. He also went to prison with Paul. We learned from Philemon chapter 23. He was so faithful. He was ready to go to prison with Paul. One more old New Testament example. Turn with me to 3rd John chapter 1. 3rd John 1. There's only one chapter. 3rd John. 3rd John. And we read about a, read about a man called Gaius. Who is he with? The famous, the, 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 the famous partner that he, he was with. He was Jesus' favorite disciple. Jesus' favorite disciple. The man on whom Jesus leaned upon. The man who sat next to Jesus in all important meetings. John the Beloved. And Gaius was part of that, his, part of his ministry team. Or Gaius was one man who helped the ministry of John. What did he do? Third John, if you read verses 1, if you read verse 5, if you read verse 6, 
verse 8. Now if you read that, it's a very short chapter. You understand, all what he did was, he welcomed all the missionaries to his home. All the traveling teachers of God's word into his home. And he gave them a good meal. He gave them good hospitality. That was his ministry. Cooking for them, taking good care of them, giving them blankets, giving them a room to stay in. That's what he did. That's what he did. Very faithful at doing that. And he never liked to come to the forefront. And uh, there's an opposite of, no, there was an opposite of Gaius right there in that book. His name is Diotrephus. Look at verse 9. Third John chapter 3 verse 9. Third John 3 9. Third John 9. Verse, third John verse 9. I have written something to the, to the church about Diotrephus who likes to put himself first and does not acknowledge our authority. Gaius is exactly the opposite of Diotrephus. Diotrephus he, he put himself first, he never encouraged the traveling teachers of God's law, he never took them home, he was backbiting John, the leader of the church, and he liked to put himself first. But Gaius put himself last, he said, all I want to do is to have God's servants in my home and help them, be hospitable to them. Be hospitable to them. I want to come to my final example and go, let's go back to the Old Testament. Let's go back to the Old Testament. This guy, is, we don't even read his name in the Bible. It's amazing. First Kings chapter 13. First Kings chapter 13. We go to a time when Northern Kingdom is divided. First Kings chapter 13. A time when Northern Kingdom is divided. We know what happened then. People were going still to southern kingdom where Jerusalem was to worship God. Every true Israelite had to go to southern kingdom in Jerusalem, had to visit the temple of Jerusalem three times every year. And this was upsetting the first king of the northern kingdom. What was his name? Jeroboam. So what did he do? He said, why do you guys have to go to southern kingdom and worship God there? I will build you an altar right here. And he built an altar at Dan, at the northern tip of the southern, northern tip of the northern kingdom, and also at Bethel, which is the southern tip of the northern kingdom. And the one at Bethel was a center of sin, because they put a golden calf altar there. If he had built a temple there, at least it would have been fine. But he built an idol there, a golden calf idol, almost a replica of what happened during the time of Moses, when Moses was away receiving God's laws. People under the leadership of Aaron were worshipping in golden cup. Almost, uh, as, as you say, uh, the one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. That's what the one great man of God said. We can be, because we keep repeating our mistakes. The one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. The people of Israel, were, Israel's favorite hobby was backsliding. They kept on doing the same thing again and again so that the heart of God was hurt to the core. And that's what is happening under the leadership of Jeroboam. At that time, God sent a man. He had a message. He had no name. I tell God, this is one honest prayer I make. Lord, I don't want a name. But give me a ministry. Give me a message. I don't want a big name. But give me a name. Give me a ministry. Give me a message. This man had no name. The Bible simply says in 1 Kings chapter 13 and verse 1, A man of God came out of Judah by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam was standing at the altar to make an offering. He built this altar, golden calf altar, and he was standing there to make an offering. At that time, the man, of, the man cried out against the altar by the word of God and said, O oh, altar, altar, thus says the Lord, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high priests, high places, who make offerings on you, and human bones shall be burnt on you. You know what happened? He keeps on prophesying against the altar. Jeroboam raises his finger against him. His finger froze. This is more dramatic than the most dramatic movie we see. He raises his hand against this man of God, who has no name, who has no name, his finger froze. And we also read, when we read the Old Testament history, whatever he prophesied took place exactly. 
exactly took place. Several years later, Josiah went from the southern kingdom, he went to the northern kingdom and he made, he desecrated the altars at Bethel and he made even pub, you know, he, he made a, he desecrated, he burnt human bones on it, desecrating it. Exactly. In fact, just like Jesus' birth was accurately full prophesied by various prophets, Josiah's birth also was prophesied. And Josiah's birth, even the name of the baby is given. You know, that's, that, that's something amazing parallel. Even the name of the baby that would be born to do that. I think Josiah read this prophecy. When he was growing up as a little boy, he read this prophecy. That gave him inspiration to do what God called him to do, to fulfill that prophecy. And he went. Amos ministered in Bethel. Amos ministered in the northern kingdom. He was from the town of Tekoa. He preached in, the, in Bethel. In Amos chapter 7 we see that he was in Bethel. There was a prophet there called Amazia. He said, stop your prophecies and get back to your hometown. Stop all your work. And that's something we hear, you know. Some of us who come from South India and come and go minister in North India, sometimes people tell us, stop your ministry and get back to your home. That's what Amos experienced. He was from Tekoa, southern part of Israel. He went to the northern part of Israel. He was ministering in Bethel, which was in the north central part of Israel. The priest in charge of that temple, you know what he said? You leave this place and go back home and make your bread there. You know why? Because he was there in the ministry to make his bread. Exactly. You want to see this in the Bible? You turn with me to Amos chapter 7. Amos chapter 7. And this is what Amazia said to Amos. Amos chapter 7 verse 12 O seer Amazia said to Amos He is the priest in charge of the temple created by Jeroboam This is Jeroboam 1 But this is the time of Jeroboam 2 Okay, it's there for a long time That altar stood there stubbornly And you know what he says here In 7 verse 12 Amazia, Amazia said to Amos O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah And eat bread there You know why? He was in the ministry to eat bread if you continue preaching here, I cannot eat my bread here. Because people will start coming, stop coming to this. People will stop worshipping idols. I won't have bread to eat. Why are we in the ministry? That's another question. To eat bread? Or to do God's, God's will, which is the food. Jesus talked about the, the food of God. Our true food is to do God's will. No, the altar at Bethel stood stubborn. Amos preached against it. But the altar stood to stood stood till there, it was, it was not broken till the man, the man of God from Judah talked about, the man, the man of God from Judah talked about, Josiah, he came and he, and he broke the altar. Now we have heard about Josiah, we have heard about Jeroboam, in fact Jeroboam is famous by a negative way. When the Bible talks about the reasons why the northern kingdom fell in 1st Kings chapter 17, why the fall of the northern kingdom, the reason why the northern kingdom came to an end, 1st Kings chapter 17, Jeroboam's name is mentioned there. Famous for the wrong reason. He is famous like Saddam Hussein and Osama bin Laden are. Famous for the wrong reason. He was famous, you now the guy he worked with was famous for the wrong reason. Nobody knew about this guy, the man of God from Judah. But he had a message. He had a ministry. And God blessed him. And God blessed him. God bless them. You know, what, what am I saying? We may never be as famous as a Joash or a Nehemiah or a Hulda or a Paul or a John or we may, never may, we may never be notorious as Jeroboam the first but we can all be faithful as Jehoshiba, Hananiah, Shalom, Epaphras, Gaius and the man of God from Judah. We can be faithful like them. We can be faithful like them. You know, you know one, I'll give you one illustration for this. It has pleased the Lord to use me in the pulpits of various churches the last, last so many years. Uh, uh, I preached in Assembly of God pulpits, in the youth camps, I preached in New Life Fellowship uh, uh, in the youth camps, Baptist, Methodist, all the denominations. But what gives, me, what gives me great joy is doing small things for God. It's like going during my break times, going to that shopping mall and giving a tract. Small things. That, that's what impresses me about a man of God like George Werber, a founder of a great organization. But I heard that even now, he goes around giving tracts. Small things. That's why, no, God may make you great. I, I'm not saying, God, I'm not against greatness. 
I'm not against it. We all should come up in life and ministry. But that doesn't mean we stop doing the small things we once were doing. We need to keep doing that. Be it giving tracts. Or being, a, being, smi- being, let it be smiling at a leper. Or, you know, teaching a Sunday school song. Let's not wash our hands of it. Because that day we want to hear, God is not going to save. God is not going to save. This is what I, this is what Jacob Cherian, one of my teachers at Southern Asia Bible College will often say. God is not going to say, well done, famous servant. No. On the day of judgment, he's not going to say, well done, famous servant. He's going to say, well done, faithful servant. Heaven is not for the famous. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, heaven is for the faithful. Heaven is not for the famous. Heaven is for the faithful. Revelation 2.10 The crown of life for the faithful. Crown of life is given for those who are faithful. And the Bible also warns us many famous guys. The guys who draw out demons. The guys who heal the sick. On that day will say, Lord, Lord, have I not done this? Have I not done this famous thing? Have I not that famous thing? The Lord will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evil goers. I want you to bow your heads with me right now and ask God, ask God to give you grace to be faithful in whatever He has called you. Whatever may be, it may be, the task that you are called to do, ask God to give you grace to be faithful. Some of you may think, well, I am doing a small thing. Does, does, does it really matter? It matters. It counts for eternity. It may be closing the gate. It may be arranging uh, in a guest room. It may be cooking a meal for an incoming visitor. It may be the ministry of prayer. It can be anything, a small thing. God says, are you faithful in that? That's more important than being famous. You can become famous, nothing wrong about it, nothing sinful about it, but that's not your goal. That happens, something. It follows you, like goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life, it will follow you. If it is God's will, it will follow you. Say, Lord, maybe it's time for us to confess our secret craving to become great. Time for us to confess. Now some of us have thought, well, I'm never as famous. Now I'm not seen on TV like, you know, Reverend K.P. Yohanan. Some of us have thought that way. I'm not there, I'm not this, I'm not as famous. We, we almost said that in a grumbling tone. No, God hates that. God hates that kind of language. God wants you to be satisfied with what He has given you and be faithful in that. He'll lift you up, no doubt about it. But don't be envious or jealous of the other person who is used by God. Because on the day of judgment, the reward is going to be the same. If a preacher, if a television evangelist is faithful to his calling, his reward is going to be the same as the wardrobe keeper called Shalom, who is going to be faithful in doing that job. The reward will be the same. It is we humans who make that difference. Because we are carried away by stage, charisma and presence. Because we are the movie generation. We are the superstar generation. We get carried away. That is the world entering the church. That is wrong, unscriptural. Be faithful in what God has called you. Do it to the best of your ability. And God will lift you up. If you don't get, if you are not lifted up in the worldly way on the day of judgment, He will lift you up. I can guarantee you that. Say, so let's ask God for forgiveness for any wrong attitudes we have had towards our work. Any wrong attitudes. And say, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And uh, let's 